Uh, but I just want to kind of share with you now a few comments from people, and I hope I can pronounce your names right, those of you who I'm going to call out. Lena Kabadi, thank you so much for saying that you felt the documentary was clear, refreshing and confronting. Um, Angelina Smolnek, again, apologies if I mispronounced that, she said she was enjoying, it was so interesting having these background stories. It's so easy to judge people for doing things like eating meat and burning fossil fuels, but it's another thing to see their lives. Um, and Paul there, again, apologies for the pronunciation, lovely to see informed participation in action, nothing quite so powerful. And a lot of people calling for super PM, which I thought was just inspiring and wonderful. Just to address a couple of little housekeeping questions that have come up quite regularly. Um, if you're in the UK, this documentary will be available on the iPlayer tomorrow, and I believe it's gonna be available for a year. Outside the UK, it is not available, but I know the team from Picture Zero are working really really hard to make sure that it gets to as many territories as possible. Um, the panel discussion that we're about to have will be available on the Albert website within a day or two. Now enough from me, no one needs any more from me, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the Mali Kodikara who is going to host our discussion and she will introduce you to all of the panellists. I will be back in a few minutes to post the questions that you're answering so do please continue to put any questions that are burning for you in the Q&A and I will do my very best to get to as many of them as possible. Over to you, Tamali. Thank you, Trisha. Wow, yeah, that is the third time I've watched the film and I get super emotional every time I watch it. Um, and we're all backstage sort of clutching our chests, like, uh, you know, ho holding on to uh, this wonderful moment. So, hello everyone. Yes, my name is Timali Kodikara and I'm speaking to you all from the Lenape ind indigenous lands known as Brooklyn, New York, hence the perhaps confusing midday sunshine behind me. But I'm super, super happy to be with you all because I am a Londoner and I did leave my heart somewhere off the Whitechapel High Street, where it's no doubt finishing a pint at the Blind Beggar. But as Trisha mentioned, I do indeed series produce and co-host Mothers of Invention, which if you don't know, is a podcast on feminist solutions to the climate crisis, where we speak to mostly black, brown and indigenous women and girls all over the world. Um, and I host it with Maeve Higgins, who's a very clever comedian and the former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, which... To this day, I try not to get too pukey about. But what I, is extra nice about this in, uh, this evening for me is that much like the people versus climate change, um, we are supported by our family at Doc Society. And if you're not familiar with Doc Society, what that has meant for our work is that we're not only thinking about our editorial development, but also how we can use stories to create social justice impact as well, because that is the power of our roles as media makers, right? Aside from making folks feel things, we also have this awesome opportunity to create a culture shift that inspires viewers to cap carbon, but also protect the most vulnerable people at the front lines who need our collective help. So getting into it, I want to introduce you all to our honorary guests, two of the assembly member members, whom I know you have stolen your heart as they have mine, which is amazing because mine's still at the pub, apparently. Sue Peachy and Mark Robson. Welcome, give us a wave, please. Thank you. Plus Steve Smith, executive producer for Picture Zero. Dove Friedman, executive producer for Curious Films. And the documentary's very own Swiss Army Knife producer, director, and shooter, Harriet Bird. And our extra special guest this evening is Nigel Topping, UK high level champion for climate action for COP26. And yes, that is Nigel's real actual title. Uh, but a bit later, Nigel's gonna come help us better understand the bigger picture around what we saw in the film. So welcome everyone and massive congratulations on your premiere. Well done. <laughs> so uh, Steve, how are you feeling? Um, a bit emotional, I have to say. It's been quite a long journey. I mean, uh, apart from the fact that the assembly took a whole year to to go through the process, um, you know, we've been working on this film now for some time. So it's great to see it finally kind of get out there and land. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think what we're all feeling after watching the film is that it is very much unlike how we're used to seeing the climate crisis framed and talked about. So, how did the film come about? Well, Picture Zero. Uh, started to try and tell uh, climate solution stories, really, because I think right. you're right. Uh, we, we've tended to see climate change through the prism of the apocalyptic, you know, the kind of what's actually happening. 
But I think we need to start addressing the solutions because that, that's what's um, so important to find a way of solving this. So when we heard that Parliament were commissioning a citizens' assembly, we just thought this was a brilliant story to tell because it would give um, diverse voices, the fact that we can allow people like, you know, Sue and Mark and, and Amy a chance to speak about climate change. We've never really seen that. It's always framed, isn't it, through scientists, politicians and academics. Yeah. But actually, it's getting real people to engage with this. And, and that's what's been so special. Yeah, a lot of data and statistics and not enough storytelling, really. So, um, Harriet, this is your first feature length documentary as producer and director. So massive congrats to you. So as um, Trisha mentioned earlier, 108 people were invited to the assembly and the demographics matched the exact makeup of the UK, which is amazing. So how did you cast each of the contributors to help give the film sort of a sturdy narrative arc for us all to follow? And, and what was the importance of this particular range of people? Um, well, as you say, you know, it's, it's really important that the film has a real range of voices um, and people with, you know, diverse perspectives. When we started on the film, when I started on the film, the, um, the sort of letters had been sent out, the assembly had been selected and they were all sort of gearing up to start. Um, and essentially we, um, the organizer of the assembly, um, Involve, emailed all of the assembly members to say, we're gonna be working with these companies to make a documentary about the assembly. Um, anyone who might be interested in taking part, get in touch with Harriet. Um, and we had, I think about 25 people got in touch, which actually out of 108 isn't, isn't too bad. It's actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, but they were all brilliant. You know, I mean, we could have filmed with a whole host of people from, from the assembly. Um, in choosing the people that we did film with, um, of course, we were looking for like uh, regional variety, people from all four corners of the UK, different ages, you know, ethnic diversity. Um, and, and, and I think people from across the political spectrum and people with a range of views on climate change. So I think it was really important that we had voices like Richards in there, who from the outset was a, a bit of a climate skeptic, you know, wanted to, uh, wanted to sort of know the science before he made his mind up because he felt that he hadn't made his mind up. Um, so yeah, I mean, we were conscious to choose a, a range of people. And, and I suppose with all documentaries, you're always looking for people who express themselves well, who are relatable, who are funny. You know, I think um, Amanda, Sue, very, very funny people who I've loved spending so much time with. So it's, um, that's always gonna come across well in a documentary about a subject like this. Um, you know, Mark's got a lot of heart. I, I sort of knew that that would, that that would sort of come through. So it was about choosing people who were really likable, really relatable, um, but who also could represent that range of views. Um, and of course, it was so important for it to be a diverse selection of people, because, as you say, the assembly was a representative sample of the UK. So we, we had to make sure we were honouring that, you know, it would be no good to have all our contributors with the same perspective to begin with. Um, so, yeah, we, we were sport for choice, but we were obviously thrilled with everybody that we filmed with. They were all brilliant. Sue and Mark, I think you can take that and put that in your pocket, probably. Pretty nice, pretty nice intro. Um, but this was a truly out of the ordinary experience for you both, wasn't it? So how, I mean, why did you want to take part in the UK Climate Assembly in the first place and then in the documentary as well? Um, do you want me to go first? Yeah, go on. Um, well, I think when I first got the invitation from the House of Commons um, and I, I said to my friend, you know, have you had one of these letters? And she said, <laughs> no. So we, we, we looked and then we found out how unique it was to even be invited to do it. Yeah. That it was almost like a public duty, almost like jewellery service, that you've been asked to, to do this for everybody on, on the planet. Um, you know, <laughs> surely you can put your name forward and spare, a, a, you know, a few weekends to go and do it. So I put my name forward and I mean, I thought, well, out of the 30,000 people that got an invitation, um, you know, I didn't think for one minute that I would get chosen to 
to do it, but I did. So I, I, you know, I put my money where my mouth was and I cracked on and I, 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 I did it. And, and as for the documentary, why did I get involved with it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's just one of those things i thought uh, in for a penny in for a pound (laughs) if you're gonna do it go the whole hog you get to do things like this basically yeah it's not not bad i've never done it before so i'm always looking for new experiences in life so um this was something i'd never done before so that's why i did it i think we all got that from you sue very much so so mark what about you uh, well, much like Sue, really, to be honest, I mean, when the letter comes through and you, and you, you actually take it on board and you actually realise it is genuine, uh, <laughs> and, and, and then you just think, well, I've got to do this, you know, I've, I've got my, my daughter, I've got my, my children, grandchildren to think of, and if I get the opportunity to, to possibly make a difference, then, you know, I've, I've, you've just got to do it, because they're going to look at me afterwards and go, why didn't you, you know, and, and with documentary, um, when I say yes to something, I say I'll go full in with everything, you see. So once the document, I went, yep, yeah, I just say yes to it and then worry about everything afterwards, you know. <laughs> pretty close, to be honest. I love it. Deeply philosophical, too. I love it. Um, Steve, um, you know, something that I think also people will want to know a lot about is, is you know, there was a, a carbon expenditure that was accounted for in the making of the film, too. But then you also had to deal with COVID halfway through. So how did each of those things affect your approach to production, the editorial and the operation side of things? Well, both Picture Zero and Albert, uh, sorry, Picture Zero and Curious Films follow Albert, you know, religiously, you know, so Albert is the home of sustainability in the UK for those of you that perhaps aren't in the UK. And, um, you know, it has great tools to help programs reduce their carbon footprint. So. Um, you know, we, we follow those principles. Um, and of course, uh, lockdown actually helped because you suddenly found we weren't able to travel as much as we might have done. Um, we were largely working remotely, which I think is something people have learned to do over lockdown, you know, in, in terms of filmmaking. So actually the, the carbon footprint, if you want to know for the, for the documentary was six tons of carbon and it cost us 61 pounds to offset it through Albert's creative offset scheme. So. So that's really good. The average uh, carbon footprint for a UK production is about 12 tonnes of tar- carbon, I think. So, so it's good. Can you quantify that into other terms, into more like uh, real life terms for us? Oh, 61 pounds a... doesn't sound like much money. but It doesn't. It doesn't. And, you know, tons so of I carbon think sounds enormous. Tons of carbon sounds enormous. I mean, I think there are questions over whether when you offset, you really do kind of offset yeah. the full amount. Clearly, to get to net zero, we need to get to net zero. We need to stop emitting that carbon in the first place. So, yeah, we have to find yeah. solutions to that. Brilliant. And then, Derv, so Curious Films has this lovely track record of telling these very quintessentially British stories. So how did um, the people versus climate change feel like a different, fresh take on storytelling for you and your team? Um, well, I think when... Fergus and Steve approached us about the idea that there was going to be 108 Brits chosen at random and set the task of solving climate change. I mean, that as a premise to any story. Casually, yeah, you know, as you do. <laughs> what, what, what a kind of entry point. And I think when we met people like, uh, you know, so that, that was always you know, very interesting for us as, as, a, as a premise. And then when we met people like Sue and Mark and Amanda, some of the others that you see in the film, that their story and their kind of questions about climate change felt so um, authentic and accessible as well. Sort of like Steve says, the the way television kind of approaches climate change and its programming is sort of tended to be, you know, through a kind of scientific or specialist factual kind of prism or lens, sometimes with a presenter who's kind of just imparting knowledge to the to the audience. And opinion. So I think when we met some of the characters like Sue and Mark, it just felt, wow, this feels really fresh as a story. And I think the film follows them all on their, their journey of learning, particularly Sue and Mark, about what they understand about climate change. And that, that, that felt really fresh to us. I don't think we'd ever seen um, a doc do that on the subject of climate change before. Yeah. 
So, I mean, hopefully we all know that the COP or Conference of Parties is this giant annual meeting of minds hosted by the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change, which is used to mitigate uh, or to brainstorm how to mitigate and adapt around the climate, climate crisis. Um, with, and with so many voices to represent it, that is a feat. But COP21 in 2015 was where the momentous Paris Agreement took place. And much like everything else on the schedule, COP26 was postponed last year due to COVID, but it is back this November and coming to home to Glasgow, uh, which is brilliant. Um, and with only nine years to go before we see irreversible effects on the planet, there is an awful lot to do, but it also sort of ups our responsibilities. So um, that's why I want to bring in Nigel, uh, Nigel Topping, so who is the high level champion for climate action for COP26. Um, Thank you for joining us, Nigel. It's an enormous honor to have you here. High level climate champion is what I like to call myself when I'm doing power poses in the mirror, but this is your actual job title. Um, but what does a high level climate champion actually do? And what are you going to be doing for us for COP26? Well, well great. Thank you. Actually, it's an honor for me to, to join. Um, I mean, the, the filmmakers and, the, and, the, and you know, and, and, and I'm, not, I'm really glad it's Sue and Mark because I watched it. I got to watch the film last night I didn't I didn't I didn't know that I was going to meet them so and um so I loved watching the film and I think it's a really important contribution to just humanizing the the complexity of navigating through this I, th I just loved its honesty and, it, and its humanity and 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 its humor and, it, and its and its sadness at the times especially at the end so yeah what is the high level climate action champion I didn't make <laughs> up the title so don't blame me in in COP21 in Paris the countries the 197 countries in, in, in a really honest kind of moment said, governments can't do this on, our, on their own. We need the whole of society. So my job in, 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 a, in a sort of own small way, I have no hard power, right? I can't get to make any decisions, but my job is to work with what the UN system calls non-state actors. So businesses, investors, cities, regions, and civil society in whatever way I can. I work with Gonzalo Munoz, who's the Chilean high level champion, and we're really trying to mobilise everybody to step up in, in a way which, um, you know, I think the film showed that when people are asked to step up and educated, then there's this kind of sense of responsibility and intergenerational. I thought that came out some of the things that I, mean, I think it was Mark was talking about, a real sense of, you know, owing this to and Sue, you know, that if you're asked to do this, it's a responsibility. So, yeah, so my, my job is to try and do whatever I can. And there's a huge community around the world, right? working on this, working at the mm -hmm. grassroots, working with business, working with us. So it's to try and do what we can to elevate ambition and action and to encourage governments, therefore, to go further and go faster. Exactly, because it's sort of still contained as being something that either scientists or hippies or environmentalists do, right? But it's actually everybody in every sector and every, you know, demographic has is playing a role negatively, yeah. but therefore can have a positive impact if it gets reversed. So. What about the assembly members' journey stood out for you, though, as we followed them from the beginning to the end of the film? I think it was the honesty that, that many of them only had a vague understanding of what climate change was about and hadn't really engaged. But when what really stood out for me was when, in a very short time, right? I know it, was, it might have felt a long time. Those they're, they're probably they're probably very tough weekends, but for over four weekends, when presented with the facts by experts. Um, and then grappling with the complexity, we're able to come to, you know, sophisticated understanding of the trade-offs and then recommendations to policymakers. So it was that, it was how quickly, when supported through the education, people can come to an understanding of a very complex issue and come to a, an informed position on, on what solutions should be. And that, that was really inspiring, I thought. Yeah, no, I agree because, you know, despite the mess around COVID, the, the film really does show that there's still very broad support for climate action in the UK. Um, and we, but we also know that docs can do this, you know, facilitate a lot of change amongst audiences. But do you think sort of from your vista that films like The People versus Climate Change can give politicians and climate officials more confidence to be bolder with their own ambitions and COP26 certainly? Well, I think I think processes like the Citizens Assembly, and you know, there's, there's a global assembly being formed, which, which will run, um, and then and then, and then of course, 
that you know that, that experience is very intimate to the hundred um, members. So I think the process and then the film together is really quite right. quite magical. And yes, I think we need to. And I, I love you talked about using stories to create impact, the Mali at the beginning. And I'm a big believer that we need. Yes, we need the science. Yes, we need the policies, but we also need to, to humanise it so that people can understand what, what 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 it means to them. And I think then it can be quite what what looks really um, maybe quite esoteric can become very compelling, right? Because it is about how we choose to live our lives and what we leave for future generations. Exactly, and I want to come back to that actually when we talk to Stephen Harriet a bit more about it. But um, I work in climate justice, which is the human rights aspect of the climate crisis. But that included in that is workers' rights, very much so. Um, Amy's story very shockingly highlights, I think, how fossil fuels are way more present in British life than I think a lot of us realised. But Mark's amazing story, I thought, was really a gemstone example of a just transition. Um, so I was hoping that maybe you could explain to our audience what a just transition is and what it could do for our very proud UK coal and gas workers who helped build our industries and our economies. Yeah, ju just transition is a little bit of climate jargon, but it, what, what, what it means is we don't just concentrate on the technologies and drive through change in technology. We also think about the effect on, on li livelihoods and communities. Actually something which we've all around the world tend to do a pretty bad job of. We, you know, we, we tend to have a very messy transitions the great thing about this transition it's predictable we know we've got to get to zero we can plan it over over you know chunks of 10 10 years at a time and that gives us time and i think and again you say mark's story is a great one like okay now i know there's going to be a transition i'm going to train so that i have the skills which allow me to come out the other side of that transition still employable and still with the job and so a just transition means really making sure that the conversation between politicians um workers and unions um, and business is is grown up and actually navigates its way through that disruption where jobs will disappear but other jobs will come and make sure that we don't have the it's kind of messy disruptions where people are left on the shelf which is a real source of anxieties i think the film brought out really clearly yeah absolutely i mean steve uh you know thank goodness that false equivalencies are sort of finally slowly but finally coming to a close um, and we're sort of on our way to universally recognizing that the climate crisis is a fact, a scientific fact. Um, but the film and TV industry response still does not reflect that or the urgency of the problem. Um, you and I both make climate pods as well, yours being the wonderful So Hot right now. Um, and in my opinion, sort of that's where most of the exciting climate content is still being contained right now. So why do you think that film and TV is still so far behind? And it's not just the UK either, it's pretty universal. Um, but how do we tackle that? How do we get into that? I'm hoping that this film will kind of reassure broadcasters actually that, um, that there's an appetite for this kind of content. I mean, um, I think there's always a nervousness, not just with broadcasters, but politicians as well, that they're not quite sure how the public will respond to climate change. And the sense of potentially telling people that they have to do things differently with their lifestyles, I think is, is a bit nerve wracking for some people. Yeah. So I think broadcasters are a bit nervous of that. But for me as a program maker, I just see this as potential opportunities. You know, if you think about all the things that are gonna have to change over the next decade, you know, how we eat, how we travel, how we use our homes. These are all subjects that we make TV shows about already, you know, grand designs and sort of changing yeah. rooms, and you know, we, we do it. So let's start thinking about what those solutions are so that we can kind of show audiences, engage audiences and let them understand how they can play their role. I think it's a brilliant opportunity. And hopefully a documentary like this will, will encourage commissioning editors that we can be braver and bolder with content. Because I think, you know, Mark and Sue show that they, they, they want to see this stuff. You know, I yeah. think both probably feel that they've not seen solutions on TV before. And hopefully, you know, this is something they'd like to see more of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll bring that to Harriet as well. You know, what do you think uh, about, you know, what, what do you think will change life for TV producers and those folks commissioning content? Um, and, and But also, how would you like them better to support your climate work? Well, I suppose I would only sort of echo what Steve said earlier, really, um, and that Dov also picked up on that, you know, we do 
we so often see any content about climate change as quite apocalyptic, quite sort of, um, or, or being given the facts by an expert, and we don't sort of often we don't often see people who we relate to sort of thinking about this and changing their mind and and um, thinking about their day to day lives. We don't we don't tell very many sort of domestic stories about climate change. Mm, it's yeah. so often, you know, uh, happening on the other side of the world. We see very moving documentaries about, you know, the natural world and the impact that, that that's happening. But but that's often quite scary. Um, I So I really hope that, um, you know, producers, commissioners will will start to look more domestically to tell stories about climate change and also to move away from that sense of like a purer than pure hero who's sort of telling you off. You know, I think um, obviously the like Greta series and films that have been on recently, they'll be very popular. They'll be watched by lots of people who will turn on to, to watch her. But there are also loads of people who will probably turn off because they don't want to be preached at. And I think, you know, seeing that, you know, the, the guys that we film with, we watch really ordinary people who we relate to, engage with this subject, think about how it affects them and change their mind. They're not telling us to change. They're not telling us off as an audience. We're just watching them do it. And actually that's really powerful. And I think, you know, we can change the mode of the filmmaking to be, to be, um, much less about you know experts and heroes telling us what to do and and more about seeing the change sort of happening here in the UK so yeah I mean I hope that happens more let let's see you know fingers crossed it will it will um I mean yeah again it's the you know, maybe a certain small percentage of the country will relate directly relate to the science maybe some will relate to doom and gloom but I think this sort of illustrates that we do need such different diverse types of storytelling to get us through it. And to uh, Nigel's point, you know, to combine the facts with this lovely um, humanized storytelling experience. Um, and so that, Sue, I actually wanted to ask you what you felt your most sort of anxiety inducing moment was during the assembly. Uh, but also what the moment was that that started to change for you and you started fe feeling a bit more optimism for the future? Um, well, I can't really say that there was an anxiety moment because I'm not that type of person. Sorry, hang on, my phone's ringing. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your fans, we know, we know. They're all lining up um, now. Uh, so, but I think on the first day, when we, we, we got to learn the basics of what climate change actually was, um, and then I understood it, then I, then I knew that, you know, obviously it was real and, and we were there to do a job and, and you know, we needed to do it. Um, so, um, yeah, what was the other question? Well, just sort of when, when you felt, started to feel optimism, that things sort of flipped from being just either you as student or you maybe freaking out for a bit because it is quite intimidating all the facts but then when you were like actually there's something I can do yeah about this well I think anybody that had been told everything that we've been told um most people would make the assumption and and, and learn from it and recognize that that things have to change so um it's just the question of educating people the same way as we've been educated um, and getting it out there and making people understand, you know, that we're all responsible. We all need to make changes. Um, and I think when we had the the lockdown and, you know, we all did, everybody in the whole world noticed the difference of probably going back centuries when there was no cars on the road, no planes in the sky. Um, and I think everybody must have thought about it then because to me, that the, the sky seemed bluer, the birds sang louder, um, the sea that you saw seemed bluer, and I think everybody must have realised then, and you thought, well, everybody can change because we've just proven that we've had to change. So people can change if 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 they're you know if they want to change and and they're given a good reason to change. Yeah, yeah. Um... You're totally right. Mark, what do you what has changed about your life forever, do you think? 
Um, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> uh, but I mean, apart from the, f- the first evening when we, when we met David Attenborough, uh, that, that there. Was <laughs> That's a good one, yeah. Um, you know, you're never going to go back on that one. Uh, I mean, uh, what, I, what I would say is, is before the assembly, before I actually uh, attended the assembly, if you said to me you need to leave, eat less meat and travel less and recycle more, I, I would have thought, yeah, okay, I know that it, that needs to happen, but I would have played like, lip service to it. Mm. Um, I wouldn't have thought you really need to. Uh, and when you got to the assembly and we were given all that information, you see the facts and then you've got the experts telling, but then you sit around the table and we all talk to each other and you're seeing people just like me um, and I would go something like, you know, I don't want to eat less meat. And then you go, you get these different reasons and you talk between yourselves and you go, well, actually, yeah, we do need to do these things. Now, I'm not saying that everyone, you know, is going to have to change everything that they do. Um, but I know for me personally now that there are certain things that maybe I don't want to do but I know I'm going to do them anyway because it, it, it's, it's for the best. And I just, I hope that if everybody else was to get the same information that we had, um, they, would, they would actually end up making the same decisions as me. You know? That's such a great response. Thank you. And to you both, actually, do you both sort of find yourselves sharing what you learned at the assembly with your friends and family? And if you do, how are they receiving it from you? You go first, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Um, yeah, no, no. I'd, yeah, so base, basically, I share everything anyway. Once I've got all this information, I can't help but just to tell everybody everything that I've learned, you know. Um, but I think the best thing is, is is actually having answers now. Like, you know, when you've got people who are saying, well, oh, oh, what you say, climate deniers. Uh, and you, get, you get, even your friends and family will say, but what about this? At least I can point them in the right direction now. Uh, and I've I'm not going to be, I'm not fond of all knowledge on it, you know, but I, I definitely know you need to have a look at this. Think about that instead. And it just sort of guides them on that little path as well. And I think that's probably one, one of the best things from that, I'd say. Yeah, nice one. Um, I know that Nigel might have to go, but I just wanted to pass one more question to Dove, actually, um, about what we should be taking away from Sue and Mark and all the other contributors' experiences, in your opinion? What should we be taking away? I think Mark sums it up really well right at the end of the mm. film. Over to the government now, get it done. Let's, um, I think they're a great example and let's hope that the kind of message of climate change doesn't get lost in the kind of message of, you know, re- recovering from from COVID and actually there's a way that, that you know, the both, the two can coexist. I think that's the biggest lesson we can all take, those final words really. So um, yeah, to the government, let's crack on, let's get it done. Well said, well said. Anything you want to leave us with Nigel before we move on to uh, Q&A? Would you think you'll be using films like The People Versus Climate Change when it comes to engaging ordinary folks in your climate work? Well, I mean, we're, we'll be pumping out on social media as many links to this as we possibly can. The more, no, the more people, the more people see it, the better because it's 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 relatable, right? It's and um and you know, as you said earlier, some people relate to the science. Some, I mean, I'm a, I, I love what Stephen Harris said about apocalypse. I, I I'm I'm fed up with what I call gloom porn. Yeah. I think I think a little bit of bad news so that people understand the science is important. But if you you that, that you can't you can't take that and turn it into action. Right, and what we need, and what we need is action. So I'm, I'm, you know, I think this sort of message: just get it done to political leaders, whether they're in the parish where Sue's going to be a pain in the ass. That was one of my favourite lines of the film. Um, <laughs> or, 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 or city mayors who have more authority, or national leaders, um, you know, and 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 business leaders as well. You know, the people who have real, you know, political and economic power. Then it's a question of just get it done. We need to see detailed plans of what people are going to do in the next five years we can only do so much as individuals those structures exist to, yes. to take action at bigger levels so i think but the overall message to just get it done um would be a great anthem to take to glasgow in november yes well into it um can we succeed in, ex- in achieving our extremely challenging net zero ambitions without the full support of the wider public or do we we, we need everybody involved at this point no, we can- we can't because you know policy makers who are, and business leaders who are the ones with the real levers of power will only go as far as society lets them go. You see, when, when we get this wrong, you end up with gilets jaunes. You end up with 
a small tax hike. So, you know, done right, um, you know, things like Fridays for the Future, Extinction Rebellion, this film will empower policymakers because they'll say, oh, people want us to do something. They'll empower business leaders saying, we've got a social license to be bolder. So we can do yeah. this, but it's going to take the whole of society. Every yeah. lever we possibly have needs to be pulled. Yeah, we need to create the culture shift. That's really what individual action is about, isn't it? It's not about yeah. getting your recycling sorted. It's like, can we all together create a big national culture shift that propels us into our net zero targets? Beautiful. Okay, so I'm going to ask Trisha to come back in um, to help us sort through some of the uh, Q&A chat um it That's, is alive the chat feed is alive it's oh my brilliant. god it's amazing i have to say i'm not looking at the chats uh, the team are doing that so if you're asking questions that they can answer they're going to give you the links to everything there but in the q and a we've got so many questions i just want to acknowledge that i've had probably a best part of 20 or so questions all asking about how this documentary and i think nigel you've gone ahead and answered it i was going to ask it can actually start to see direct change in terms of government. And I suppose the answer to that probably is the sharing and you've kind of touched it on already, but is there anything else that you'd want to add to kind of um, address that question about how this documentary can lead in a sort of more linear fashion to um, policy change and changing government? Well, I think something that, something that uh, I mean, the film was a very human film, but it didn't actually sort of list all the policy recommendations. So I think, um, linking the film to the specific policy recommendations would be a good way forward to say, you know, here's, you've seen the film, you know, and, and, and I, I would think of a sort of social media campaign to point to what came out of the assembly. I mean, we got, we got a flavour of it, but we didn't actually get the, I mean, that wasn't the job of the documentary. I would like to see more of that, about what did, doc, what did the assembly have to say about energy, about transport, about aviation, about diet, because um, that, that, I think, used the film as a way into some of the more geeky content that came out of the assembly. That's great. Thank you very much for that. So there are a lot of questions for Sue and Mark coming through. You have really captured everyone's hearts tonight. Um, so um, really, people want to know what you think about the Citizens' Assembly and the Climate Assembly as a way to make decisions. They're really, really keen to understand what you thought about the process. That question has been asked by a number of people. Can you have a comment on that? Um, well, I think is a good way to just let normal everyday people get get involved in making decisions for everybody that lives in this country or on the planet or whatever. So why should it always just be the politicians that make the decisions? Mark, any thoughts from you? Oh, I think Sue's just summed it up there. You know, I think uh, there should be more of them. Uh, if you. I would have spent more time doing that. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you asked me to do another one, I'd snap your hand off straight away. It's, it was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Um, there was a question specifically for Sue, and it was um, specifically, what are you going to do on the Paris Council? People want to know what your first um, big move is going to be. Um, I don't know. Um, I've got lots of ideas, but um, it's been very difficult because um, I haven't actually met any of the other parish councillors yet because we've only met on Zoom. So um, I'm looking forward to actually meeting and getting together. And I mean, although things have been up, I have declared a climate emergency for my parish, which is Bath Eastern. Um, so it's just now trying to get things into place um, and, and getting everybody to uh, recognise and encourage them to, to make small or any sort of changes in their life. Brilliant, thank you very much. Steve, there's a question for you about whether or not, um, or maybe for you, Harriet, um, or Dove, I don't know, but uh, about whether or not you think there might be a follow-up film. So they are saying that they loved the fact that you revisited and saw the sort of the changes in behaviour of people, but what about 12 months from now? Will there be some other way to go back and see what's happened later on? I'd, I'd love to do that. I mean, I, I think because we've got this sort of finite time, haven't we? We've got to halve emissions by 2030. I think we could revisit some of these people and see how they get on. I'd love to take people like Sue and Mark up to COP26, uh, you know, in November and sort of get, get them actually kind of talking to world leaders. And, and I'd love to follow that. I think that'd be brilliant. Fantastic. I'm very mindful of time, Thamali. Well, Trisha, just, just on that point, yes. Steve, um, part of the, the high-level champions, Gonzalo and I, 
we, we get to um, curate a bit of the blue zone in COP. So if you want the stage to talk about doing something, then get in touch. Uh, thank you. Fantastic. Uh, maybe just one more, and I'm a huge apologies to all of the amazing questions I haven't been able to answer. And I apologize, I have wrapped them all up into sort of one where the similar um, um, question had been asked. Um, Lenny says, I think this is a really important point. There are still some climate skeptics who will see this film as propaganda. So what do we do um, to help uh, bring upon uh, bring up on board the most hardened skeptics? Can I can I just uh, have a stab here and I just say yeah. yet again, I think this is the role of the media, you know, I'm also an Albert trainer, as, as you know, Tricia. So I've been helping train the film and TV industry about understanding about climate change over the last six years. And um, it strikes me that our industry is investing a lot of money into training filmmakers about this. But actually, we as program makers now need to be investing the time to sort of train the wider public. I, I'm very aware of, uh, uh, about how little most people understand about climate change. And I think, you know, Sue highlights that perfectly. So I think, you know, we have a huge role to up our game in sort of uh, educating the wider audiences who still use TV as the main source of news and information, don't they? So, so that's something that we, we have a big challenge to do, I think, to help kind of get, because we need to remember that our industry, it was only kind of 2017-ish, 2018, that we stopped presenting climate change as part of an impartial debate. You know, do you remember the time when we would always have to get Nigel Lawson on to rubbish what a scientist said? You know, so our industry has got a lot of catching up to do. We, 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 were, we were very bad, weren't we? It's sort of, you know, rubbishing the science sometimes. Yeah, less say, less false that? equivalencies and more science, more scientific fact, surely, please. <laughs> Absolutely. That's all from me, Damali, because I recognise that you've got to yeah. wrap up. Thank you yeah. very much. And thanks again for all the questions. They were amazing. Yes, yeah, of course. Yes. I mean, I think we could all happily do this all day long. Um, but I'm sure we all finally have tons of people to hug this week. So um, I will wrap up the discussion. I want to thank Nigel Topping, Sue Peachy, Mark Robson, Steve Smith, Doug Friedman and Harriet Bird for joining us tonight. Um, before you go, please do check out all the links that folks have been frantically typing into the chat um, to Doc Society's projects, the Albert production and editorial trainings, which are amazing, but also the latter is run by none other than the man himself, Steve Smith. Um, and you might even see me loitering about every once in a while, so ample reason to sign up. Um, but lastly, a final reminder that the People versus Climate Change will be available uh, exclusively on the BBC iPlayer from 8am tomorrow for a whole year. So please, please, please share it with your climate curious friends and family. Um, and other than that, I wish you all well. Thank you for joining us. Blessings and good night.